Hello everyone, my name is Katya and I would like to welcome you to the second action session for today. Emilio Hernandez and Anna Sandgren, the founders of the initiative Green Light Alliance and the Lighting Practice Strum, based in Sweden, are going to talk about lighting design for the circular economy. Write your questions down on the chat. We have a Q&A session in the end. And of course, remember to check and also answer the poll's questions. Emilio and Anna, over to you. Hi, everyone. We have been invited here today to talk to you about circular design and circular economy when it relates to lighting design. My name is Anna, and this is Emilio. And we are both lighting designers. However, we will, uh, through this presentation, look at circular design as it relates to the industry as a whole. We also want to introduce the Green Light Alliance, which is a new initiative uh, for everyone in the lighting sector. Uh, it's aimed at bringing us together and understanding the role of uh, adopting and promoting circular design. We'll give some examples of the initiatives taking place uh, and some more detail about what we're up to towards the end of this presentation. We've also asked a couple of online poll questions uh, before we started our talk, so hopefully we can talk about those later. So to talk about circular design, uh, we first need to look at the current method of design and production used the world over, which is the linear economy. This is a take make waste model where we go through resource, manufacture and distribution. Products have a period of useful life and then they end up as waste. Next to this, we can see the famous butterfly diagram, which uses the waste equals food model inspired by nature. The diagram has two hemispheres, the biosphere on the left, which covers natural materials and relying less on human intervention, and the technosphere on the right, focused on manufacture. At this point, it's probably worth covering the terms sustainable and circular as they overlap a little bit. A sustainable development or product is one that meets the needs of present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Circularity focuses on responsible and sustainable resource cycles and aims to keep materials at their highest point of value in the chain for as long as possible. However, this cycling of materials in the technosphere needs to be designed in, uh, has to be part of the manufacturer process and supply process, since it's not something that will happen by itself without human intervention. So how does this diagram relate to the lighting industry? Uh, first, looking at the two that we are most familiar with, which is maintain, prolong and recycle. Maintenance and the desire to designing a maintainable scheme is commonly discussed during the design process already, but it's arguably not always something that is prioritized. Uh, recycling, we're all familiar with, but in terms of circular design, it's not really something that should be, should be considered as a last resort. Uh, refurbishment and remanufacturing, we see a lot in heritage projects, even though the driving force here is usually product attachment more than circularity. We see relatively little of refurbishment when it comes to architectural uh, lighting elements. Reuse and distribution is probably the elements within the diagram that we see the least of currently. It's probably down to the logistic complexities that that sometimes bring. The final point, it's worth noting that a lot of materials considered having been recycled are being incinerated uh, instead of being recycled and giving a second life, which means that it's actually a linear process and not circular. So let's look uh, in a bit more detail at the problem at hand. Uh, electronic waste or WE is the world's fastest growing waste stream. So moving away from a linear economy is as much about avoiding the mismanagement of natural resources uh, as it is about embedded carbon and uh, making new materials. And recycling and sustainability are very broad terms and recycling itself, as mentioned, is not really a sufficient solution. A more drastic change from a linear economy to a circular one is needed. Currently, 3% of all electronic waste placed on market is recycled annually. The rest is either recycled using incorrect methods or not at all. The government targets for all recycling treatment facilities for, is for 75% uh, of material recovery and 55% recycling, which gives you an idea of where the target is set today. 
Uh, another issue is that this is a very complex change to supply and specification system that's needed. Uh, the built environment doesn't currently provide enough incentives to collaborate, solve the logistical problems that, that are needed. This is making it difficult to get clients to buy into circular solutions. And finally, lots of people are working on how to move away from a linear economy to a circular one. And we will be giving some examples of this in the next few slides. But we believe that a new system like this really needs greater collaboration across the whole industry. So here we can see the REAP stages aligned with the circular design and linear design principles. Uh, the opportunities for circular design currently mainly exist around the latter REAP stages, as the brief and design stage is still not fully incorporating the reuse of waste. Many clients we work with rarely see the value from anything other than payback. Perhaps this is our fault as designers, it's in part we're highlighting other values such as environmental benefits, cheap material sourcing, brand values, customer satisfaction could uh, encourage the use of circular principles. So different scopes and engagement are needed to allow for circular design to take place. This initially will take, will result in larger design free as it needs more time, which is not an incentive for the client. Um, circular design collaboration between supply chains such as designer, contractors and manufacturers is not currently happening due in part to the lowest bidder after being rewarded uh, based on price uh, on a project regardless of their environmental principles. We also see a lack of environmental detailing on our specification, which means that the lowest bidder doesn't necessarily have to play by the same rules um, as those originally specified. So this extra collaboration and detail inspects is needed to close the loop. Perkins and Wheeler Architects uh, fit out team have introduced a REBA ghost stage eight in their design process, which focuses on material passports, audits of strip outs prior to making early decisions on the brief and content stages for new projects. They'll be talking about this in the Greenlight Alliance article in an upcoming ARC magazine. So here's a snapshot of some sustainability opportunities within the REBA stages at the moment. Lead and Brian we're very familiar with and are quite commonplace and they deal with the avoidance of waste and the reduction of material uses, but not circular design. Zarg is a consortium of manner for LED manufacturers and it assists with the topic of avoiding obsolescence uh, and enabling upgradability of LEDs within light fixtures. There's also a few manufacturers, um, Skinflint and Fmark for example here, who deal with uh, circularity either early on in the design phase or through refurbishment or remanufacture of mid-century products. Compliance schemes as well, such as Recolite and Lubicon here, they're two of the largest of 26 uh, such compliance schemes in the UK. There's also Ecolite within Europe. Uh, they focus on dealing with the end of life of a product responsibly, but the goal of circular design is for recycling to be a last resort. So what opportunities are there to close the loop? Well, in, in the brief, the inclusion of circular design in the, relies on having an informed client. Uh, it needs commitment, it needs budget and good governance throughout the project, as well as potentially additional programme. This is being helped at the moment with schemes such as the Anna MacArthur Foundation, who raise the profile of circularity, B Corp promote responsible practices on a business level, uh, as well as other forms of value. They're, they're not just circular focused, they have pillars on ecology and social values. Research is also critical, really, that the scientific aspect for rating systems and objectively understanding the environmental impact of carbon footprint of a product or life cycle is key. And there needs to be collaboration between these bodies. Uh, they can also inform circular checklists. Uh, so designers and suppliers alike can work out the best way to specify circular products. Organisations like the SLL, Lighting for Good and Cradle to Cradle, they're all developing or have partly developed checklists. So the GLA sees its role to ensure that they're communicating and aligning their standards. So checklists, uh, who wants another checklist, you might think. Uh, there's already quite a lot of them out there. Uh, so the first thing to look at is whether or not they're aligned and how they overlap. The checklist should not be a tick box exercise. Um, and they should more be an exercise about encouraging and promoting new opportunities within the design process. 
So elements such as introduce circular principle right at the start and how to um, approach this to the client, create guidance of how and when to reuse existing light fittings, tools of how to introduce circularity in a new product specify on a project, and maybe the most challenging part would be how to look, lock the specification to avoid this principle being lost during the VE process. So as mentioned at the GLA, we've been reaching out to the organizations creating these checklists and manufacturers that they've been working with and collaborating with to get an idea of how they differ and how they align. Lucent have been doing work with Lighting for Good, Wycroft with Cradle to Cradle, and Stone have been working to become B Corp accredited. They've also recently released their Renew uh, service, which allows them to service products on site uh, rather than being disposed of or recycled. So again, there'll be a series of uh, talks and reviews on these in the coming ARC magazine articles, so keep an eye out for those. Lastly, we've been discussing with other architects and fit-out suppliers about uh, how they can deal with strip-out more effectively and how that can feed back into the, the, the start of the chain. So they've mentioned uh, that some of their suppliers offer buyback schemes, uh, and they've discussed a dealership strategy and discounts based on return of product from an older fit out. So these offer a different spin on what we talk about uh, previously uh, as light as a service, which is a model that's been uh, the center of some contention within the lighting industry. So as mentioned by Anna previously, this needs reverse logistics. It needs different warranties. It needs remanufacturing stations within factories, agreement on things like material passports that enable us to track how many hours an LEDs burn or material provenance. So there's, you can understand how this sort of system can become overwhelming in this quite disruptive change. So in order to help with that, here's seven key circular design principles that we've applied to some lighting scenarios. And you note here on the right, there's some different responsible parties for driving these principles, but they all overlap. And again, therefore they need collaboration. So the first one will be the reduction uh, in the amount of light and light fittings used in the first place. For lighting designers, uh, it's to only illuminate the surface and element that is needed, having a targeted and intentional approach. For manufacturing, it's more about reducing the materials used and trying to design out waste material as much as possible. Second principle would be product attachment, which mentioned earlier. Um, the more emotional connection you can create to a product, the more likely you are to take good care of them. Uh, this doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be the most highly engineered product. Uh, it's very durable. Sometimes it can be a light shape, like the Willy Dilly seen here uh, in the photo, which is possibly the least hard wearing uh, product, but due to its charm and attachment, it evokes, uh, it stands the test of time. Conversely to that, product durability is uh, something which is important to countering functional obsolescence. We all have our go-to product, be it a bomb-proof elder lit driver or uh, an external product like this radiant fitting that you know you can rely on to, to stand the test of time uh, in architectural lighting. So building to a, a degree of quality is key. Uh, equally though, standardization aims, as we mentioned earlier, at countering obsolescence through the changes of system design. So if we're building a product to last a long time, we also need to consider how it can be upgraded and what principles we need to include to allow that to happen. So the fifth principle is the ease of maintenance and repair. So enabling a product, the ability to be maintained and repaired throughout its life is a key element in order to keep it functioning within its current life cycle and stop it being perceived as waste. Next up, we have upgradability and adaptability. So rather than what goes into a product, this focuses on how the product is designed to accommodate changes in its environment and use. This could be from changing the optics to changing the mounting detail on something to extend its life. Disassembly, uh, finally, for design for remanufacture is key, but it shouldn't inhibit the ability to recycle, which uses often mechanized processes at the end of life. So the information that we've just run through with you has been shared with the Greenlight Alliance uh, by people wanting to help uh, the discussion and share their knowledge. Uh, but what is really the Greenlight Alliance, you might think? 
Well, there is some overlap with uh, how it's structured when you compare it with women in lighting. Uh, in that it's, whilst it is a lighting industry platform, its key message isn't necessarily about light. It's more to raise the profile of circular design to connect people and to facilitate discussion on the topic of circular economy in our industry. It's also important to highlight that although we are both lighting designers, uh, it's ultimately the success behind the alliance is largely down to the fact that all members of the lighting communities are getting involved so that we get a broader insight of the, and knowledge of how uh, we can move to a circular design model. We spoke to Sharon and Martin during the early stages of the setting up Green Art Alliance project and something that helps to appreciate is the importance of having a clear vision and mission. So the key part of the line is to work towards industry standards on circular design uh, that are universally recognised and to provide a hub for discussion and education uh, in the circular design and circular economy. We also appreciate that there's a limited amount of time that people have to commit to the many aspects of light design that, that draw on their demands. So the, the GLA helps to collectively lift the fog on this portion and help speed that process up. So all of this does seem like a lot of effort and potentially cost. Um, so why is that? Essentially, it's because we didn't price the environment correctly in the first place. We feel that the GLA is needed to help shape the legislation through discussion. There's differing views and ideas on how that's best achieved, be it through biomaterials or through different methods of reuse and remanufacture. And there needs to be a greater awareness of the work undertaken and sharing of that knowledge base to bring everyone up to a level. And ultimately, the circular economy isn't an end goal, it's an ongoing discussion and process of refinement. So lastly, we want to invite you all to join the community and help shape the story. The first you can do is to join and become an ally and to follow uh, all the social uh, media platforms. And if you have a specific area of interest, please email us directly and we can hopefully uh, continue discussion during our Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna and Emilio. What an amazing topic, really, really important. As uh, Kevin Theobald mentioned on the chat that I can see, very topical, if we can say. <laughs> I feel we know very little uh, about the topic as lighting designers, but also generally in, in and out of the industry. So I found this initiative really, really important. And I'm sure that we will all be supporting it in the maximum level. So I would like to congratulate you for, for you. this initiative. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for your uh, comments here on the chat. Uh, if you have specific questions, I would like you to uh, hashtag ask and ask for your, your comment. I do have some questions for Anna and Emilio, so I will start with my questions first until somebody will uh, come and ask something on the chat. So yeah. um, I found very, very interesting these seven circular principles that you, you mentioned, very useful uh, for people to, that we can also communicate them to the industry in and out, the lighting community. But I would like you to, to, th to tell us what are the first steps that we should take as designers to consider the circular economy on our project. So like really kind of one, two, three. Yeah. 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 Well, I think the first thing that sort of seems obvious but is to reduce. That's the, the best thing that we can do is to, to look at reducing. And I think that as lighting designers, I, I would argue that we probably do that. We come in uh, at a stage and we, we don't want to overlit a, a space. So it's probably something that we already do, but it is important. Uh, and it's important that we have circularity as a way to sort of back that up uh, as well. Uh, and secondly, sort of challenging the, que the, the question in the beginning to the client is asking if they would be open to using uh, a refurbished product in their scheme or reusing something that they already have. Uh, it might not be uh, the whole project, but it might be a part of it, uh, at least. Um, and then as designers, I think we need to get uh, more sort of familiar with circularity because it is sort of a different way of, of doing it. We're doing it in a linear way now. Uh, so the more we know about it, the more we can sort of 
and learn how to we can use it as opportunities in the projects instead. Yeah, I mean, for example, like maintainability, uh, we already write that into our specs, but we don't look at it from a, a, a circular economy perspective, which might include something like solderless joints where the LED board meets the, the, the heat sink, which would enable maintenance to take place on site or uh, you know, without specialist tools. Uh, and and that's, that makes it easier for the product to have a second life further down the line. And do you think also, except of the prod, uh, the products and all the consideration, all the things that you mentioned above, do what is the from the manufacturer's perspective? What is the best way that they can actually be part of this and support it and make the make play a very important role on this whole circular economy um, uh, movement? So, what do you think? Like, should they be more transparent with? products like what is the what is the way from your perspective I, th I think perhaps um you know something we've discussed is the, the, the question of whether or not we should encourage manufacturers to have a, a circular range um but but really we feel that that's not really the the sort of the best way or the most effective way it, it requires a more fundamental change to how that how they operate uh, in terms of their approach to sustainability so instead of leading with just one sustainable range, it's more about looking at your whole uh, your whole range, and uh, you know you can't you can't we can't ask manufacturers to change everything in one go, but perhaps looking at the low hanging fruit and looking at the thing that they sell the most of, or the product which by weight or by volume is you know uses the most materials, and then trying to apply principles to that first, and then looking at how it can be rolled out across the rest of the scheme. But it's, it's certainly it's not about new products. Perhaps it could be about looking at existing ranges that they've stopped making, uh, and then contacting, you know, clients on schemes that they think might have, uh, you know, been in, in place for twenty years or so, and might need an upgrade. And looking at how how they could you know, remanufacture products which have already been in in the market for 15, 20 years. Very interesting. Yeah, I'm gonna read. One question that we see here from Anna, Anna Asun Asuncion. I hope you are pronouncing her name correctly. Um, would you la would you have a list of manufacturers that promote and implement circular economy in the creation of their products? A number of brands tend to manufacture their items in China and have it shipped abroad. How can we ensure that the manufacturing of products don't evolve a high level of carbon footprint? Um, well, this is this is quite it's a very good question, and it's yeah. one that we're we're liaising with manufacturers at the moment um, to help answer. So, ultimately, there would be a uh, a list of manufacturers that meet certain circular design criteria um, that just by virtue of the product being shipped a long way doesn't necessarily uh, mean that it can't be circular or meet circular principles. Um, but there's a lot of research going into the impact of uh, you know, the carbon uh, sort of life cycle, if you like, of, of materials that go into products. Um, but yeah, ultimately a list would be... That's kind of the, the goal, isn't it? To have people that you know, that you trust, that you go to and they, I mean, as designers, we, we're not, I mean, I'm not a product designer, so I, I, I rely on them to to sort of uh, have done that work, but uh, but having conversation with them so that you know that the, the manufacturer that you're using is actually not, um, as she said, as Anna said, um, having sort of another bad impact on the environment sort of when it comes to the carbon footprint. I mean, that's something that uh, with, we mentioned uh, Whitecroft and Cradle to Cradle, and they're a third party assessor. So they do a lot of, um, there's, there's a lot of uh, sort of mutual conversation and assessment that happens of their product range and the materials that go into their products uh, for them to get accredited. But it's quite an expensive process. And I think what we're looking to help promote is the idea of a process that is affordable. Uh, but is um, is still accredited. It still has to be, you know, assessed, uh, and maybe you know, it's it's assessed um, as part of the community. So people look at each other's products and and rate them. So it's, it's very transparent in that way. Yeah, absolutely. And it's also very complex. And I would say 
uh, because as you said the question is quite it's like an ongoing thing that we need to step yeah. up and all together contribute so i would like to invite anna who asked this question to uh, connect with the, with the initiative on social media and provide uh, any and not only Anna, of course, like everyone, provide your perspective and things that can help this initiative. I'm going to go to the next question because we do have a few now. Um, okay, so another question from another Anna, Anna Spoku. Mm -hmm. um, would it be possible to generate a database of available uh, refurbished equipment? Which I think it's a um, very, very yeah. good point. It might yeah be something in the UK, Emilio, do you, I, I'm not 100% sure, but I remember uh, spotting something. Yeah, Skinflint, I mean, that's more decorative, isn't it, than architectural, but Skinflint, they do that, they they refurbish uh, fittings that they find all over Europe, and then they, they sell it. Um, so in terms of a database, um, well, yeah. ultimately, that's going to be the goal. So we've got two problems with circular design. One is that we've got this this huge um, sort of wealth of material that's on the market already that isn't really well catalogued, and that needs to be you know, assessed in reviews just before buildings are stripped out or you know, uh, demolished to see what what assets are there. But at the moment, that's that's kind of quite a labour intensive process to pick through, uh, and then. At the other end of the spectrum, with things that we're specifying now, we can ensure circularity by you know, QR codes or asset tagging on, onto products, so that um, you know that can be written into the, the BIM model and, and the facilities managers' manual, so that they you know they know what assets they have and they can you know, look to offload those to people that are interested in remanufacturing them, and, and the client can can actually get some money out of that before the end of the scheme. So. Um, it's before it becomes a, a you know incumbent on them to do so they can actually uh, proactively manage that that kind of flow of resource and i also think it's, it's important that we ask for as designers because uh, manufacturers won't create ranges for us before we we've asked for them or it's kind of it needs to be requested as well otherwise um they don't know that it's actually something that we're going to be specifying yeah very good point and of course like again it's one of the things that uh, could be created somewhere that we can all contribute and maybe create this database uh, with available equipment so thank you anna for asking i'm gonna go to the next question we're gonna we have well yeah let's try to answer two more questions before we go to the networking session so yes. um matthew matthew allen oliver uh, he's asked are you hopeful of any further governmental initiatives that may incentivize this movement? Or do you think this is something that will be pushed by individual responsibility from designer, builder, or manufacturer? Well, th there is policy uh, coming in um, sort of towards the end of 2021 uh, as part of a European norm to improve the uh, sort of maintainability of products that you know to require less specialist tools and to require um you know less specialist skill as well to do that um there are the the, the problem with mandates is that they don't specifically um like necessarily overlay neatly onto what we do as lighting designers so we need to you know those seven principles of for, for maintaining a product that we just ran through they are they're circular design principles uh, they're not things that we've come up with to improve circular design. All we've done is just apply them to lighting. And you will have noticed that some of them are more obvious, uh, you know, easy to overlay, and others looked a bit maybe repetitive or a bit, you know, sort of the, the repair and upgrade versus the maintain. That distinction isn't so um, so strong in lighting. So it's up to us to kind of, um, you know, help guide that. And, and that's where this discussion is really important. Um, and so that's really the GLA's goal it isn't to kind of produce these standards or to produce databases or lists. It's to encourage the discussion with the right level of expertise in, in the industry. Yeah, and I think that follows also another question from uh, Kaya, uh, Kaya Fala, uh, who is asking, do you think that lighting guidelines and start standards need to be reviewed now that we are more concerned about this matter? And I think it's kind of connected with what you just mentioned from a perspective that this 
topic is quite complex as mm. far as we can all understand and it needs to be um a, yeah like adjusted with yeah, different and, different ways and i think it's important that if we can lead the the discussion and lead the conversation so if we the gla we the, the real thing is about discussing it together with manufacturers and together with uh, sort of the client so that we can then uh, shape uh, and, and help conversations around those guidelines so it's not something that someone else puts on us but it's actually something that we can help um, form um, and, and influence at least. And the SLL are going to be releasing some guidance very soon on this and it's very um, it's not sort of really pres prescriptive guidance but it's very applied very useful steps that you can take to do this so um, and depending on the response on that they will uh, they will build on that uh, and, and um, the SLL is a member of SIBSI and it could be that it then rolls out into other sectors within building services so lighting might have been able to be a sort of pioneering discipline and then those same circular principles could roll out into you know mechanical uh, or you know ventilation things like that so um, the, the standards are the changes to standards are coming uh, and you know, that's good. That's good. <laughs> good to know that we can actually yeah create some impact here. Okay, um, there are also a few other questions. I'm gonna pick one more uh, before we go. Um, so uh, Titia, I think she's a light artist. Uh, she asks, I try to apply recycling in my light art projects, but the problem is that people often choose the latest te techniques. And I also used in light art project only the natural light, but this was poorly understood during the light festival uh the audience was not ready is this recognizable so i guess that from from what i understood that the question is also connected with uh you did mention that as well before like with the refurbishment and the latest techno latest technologies and latest techniques if we could say here um uh, how do we how, how do we inspire let's say like yeah. change from that perspective and go back to projects and say okay this product can be improved in that way. I don't know, like what, what's your point on that? It's difficult. The, the integrity uh, of whether something's circular or not isn't always immediately visible by looking at it. So, you you know, we might think that a, a sustainable products made of, you know, wood, laminate and reclaimed fishing nets or something like that, and that that would be very obvious upon seeing it. But that that doesn't have to be the case with, with circular design. So, um, uh, it, it's about the reuse of things that are already out there and it doesn't need to look second hand that's a, a lot of the problem is that the perception of quality is quite low um which which moves people away from their desire to use reuse products if something's remanufactured so i suppose it is a really challenging narrative to get across um that you know it, you might see it in a, in a phone that if you buy a reconditioned phone it looks exactly like a new phone uh, it's just a bit older and how does somebody know that you're using a reconditioned product uh, and that that's actually good for the environment? The challenge is, uh, you know, as an artist, I think, in there for you. Yeah. yeah so yeah. the perception of the whole topic is kind of where we all need to ideally help uh, sort of change the narrative around it uh, and be more, yeah, see it more as a as a, as a opportunity um, and less of a sort of, oh God. Uh, I'm going to have to use a circular product on this. Uh, it should be something that is is just as good or even better uh, uh, than the other products that we used to use. And I can't I think see the polls, uh, Katia. I don't know whether yes, you've got. I was about I was about to ask to to close it with on that yeah. way because uh, we did have the polls and uh, many people vo uh, voted and uh, uh, yeah answered. So on the question, the first question, do you think circular design will promote or challenge creativity in lighting design? We kind of like half. So we have 56% uh, for promote and 43% for challenge. So it's quite interesting of how yeah. do we, uh, the participants here today, um, consider. Well, going back to that last question, that shows exactly how much of a, a, a challenge it is and, and what Anna yeah. was saying about perception um you know with with the move to led or, or energy saving lighting we originally we struggled it was more expensive there were fewer options 
and now it's it's unwrapped this entire different dimension of how we can light things and you know what sources we can use so it will seem challenging to begin with but um it might unlock more potential yeah I, i'm sure that it will and last uh, last question here on the poll we have the is the circular current is the circular currently included in the brief of any project uh, that you are involved in and here we have the majority 64% saying no um but we do have also a 35% saying yes so yeah. we are i'm sure that by raising awareness and talk about it more and uh, help on you know like getting all of this information you just mm, had a fantastic presentation that if, if we can all share this uh, by the way guys the record is, this is recorded and um we are going to be sharing this online uh, so everyone can share this presentation. It can benefit not only our industry, but like everyone that has to do with the building um, uh, industry. So I don't know if I think, so thank you so much, Anna thank and Emilio, you. that was great. Thank you everyone for being here with us and uh, hope to see you in the networking session.